I was inspired by just the opportunity, you know, and, you know, I know what this brings. I know that I'm going to either kill someone, someone's yeah. going to kill me, I'm going to be incarcerated for the rest of my life. Yeah. And I, shit, I, I might as well try the, the positive route and right. see what happens, you know, because there's no limits, you know yeah. what I mean? And I was exposed to more things and, you know, I got great results. How do you rise out of your circumstances? So many of us didn't grow up with the best, you know, circumstances, didn't grow up rich, didn't grow up in the best place, maybe not the best family. I'm talking to Karan Butler about his book, Tough Juice. This is a good book. And it talks about how you went from you know, your family poverty all the way, becoming a multimillionaire, drafted number 10 in the NBA bat, professional basketball league. And so thank you for coming, my man. Appreciate your family. Tell them the story about how when you were growing up, you were you were 13 and you were already six foot six. Yeah, man, I was already six foot six, just, you know, balling, hooping, you know, on the corner like a statue. <laughs> But uh, you and, uh, know, didn't you say they didn't have shoes for you? I, I I had to wear smaller shoe sizes all the time, you know. So instead of having my natural size at 13, I always had to wear 11 and a half or 12. Wow, that's yeah. like the Chinese foot binding. Yeah, man, it jacked Tired. my feet up. It jacked my feet up forever. <laughs> but now I always wear a size bigger now, and I'm you really? know fortunate enough to get the right size shoe now. So you wear I'm, a size bigger just to say absolutely, just to say fuck it. You said I could. <laughs> I didn't have the money, now I got the money to get whatever I want. I have it back in the day, now I'm good, I'm blessed, so I'm very fortunate. What I want to talk about, we're talking about Quran's new book. It's actually a great book, because sometimes athletes put out books and they're not good. This one I personally read and vouched for. Appreciate that. Tough juice, and by the way, it's got Kobe Bryant wrote the foreword. Mamba. The Black Mamba wrote this. <laughs> now, for somebody watching, because I got an international crowd, you might not know too much about American basketball, but Karan pulled off one of the biggest achievements mm -hmm. in sports. He was drafted 10th in the top 10 of the NBA, what was it, 02? Yeah, 2002. 2002, drafted number 10. So just to put that in perspective, over 300 million people in the world play basketball. 300 make it to the pros. And in terms of being top 10 in the draft, you know, that's, that, that's hard. It was special, man. You know, getting drafted by the godfather of the NBA, no, none other than Pat Riley, the legend. Um, you know, him choosing me was just, it, it spoke volumes because all the people that went and worked out for him during that draft class, yeah. and I didn't even go to Miami. You know, I thought I'd be going in the draft by that time, and I slipped to number 10, and I got the phone call. He took me, and it changed my life forever. Pat Riley, if you don't know, is, you know, the Lakers, Magic Johnson, Kareem. Showtime. Showtime. And he went to Miami and won championships. And he's known as one of the best. Ta he got the eyes for talent. Absolutely. Because he took Miami, which was an, an expansion team, and turned them into Wade, Dwayne Wade, Shaq. So now, one thing I want to talk about in this book, a few things. Um, and this book's on Amazon, right? Absolutely. It's the best place to get it, Amazon. One of the things that I kind of, I do these little bookmarks. You're not supposed to do these. They tell you not to do it in school. But for me, books are not for show. They're for learning. And so one of the things that I, I recorded a video on YouTube. I want to get your opinion on this. And, it was, and a lot of people resonated with it. It was called Rising Out of the Ashes. Because when I read the stories of successful people like yourself and throughout history, take Winston Churchill. TMZ, I was at the Super Bowl. And TMZ said, hey, Todd, they the video. what do you think the Falcons need to read in the off season because they lost, came back, you know, they were up 28 to three. And I said, they should read the story of Winston Churchill because he, at World War II, he was started out a hero, failed, went down, burned up his career for 20 years, no one believed in him, then he rose out of the ashes. For you, your story, and you talk about this in the beginning, how your family from the cotton fields in Mississippi, you know, rising out of poverty, going to, to uh, Racine. Yep. That's how you pronounce it? Racine. Racine, Wisconsin. And then you rising out. You, you're the kind of the first person in your family to make it big, I'm assuming. Yeah, anything. Yeah. You know, and it was just, it was a special thing because all the women in our family worked on assembly lines, you know, yeah. in the industry and, you know, working in factory, whether it was case or incinerator or things like that, doing manual labor in the foundries. And, you know, for me, you know, the things that 
fascinated me from the second that I jumped off the porch was, you know, drug dealers and things like that. I, you were, you, you dealt drugs. Yeah, I sold drugs. You got that, that Jay-Z story. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd done everything, you know, on the streets. And um, after I got incarcerated and went through that whole process when I got out, you know, I was inspired by just the opportunity, you know, and, you know, I know what this brings. I know that I'm going to either kill someone, someone's yeah. going to kill me, I'm going to be incarcerated for the rest of my life. Yeah. And, I, shit, I, I might as well try the, the positive route and right. see what happens, you know, because there's no limits, you know yeah. what I mean? And I was exposed to more things, and, you know, I got great results. One of the things you said here in the book, let me see if I can find it, you said, oh, I know, it's here, you were talking about who you think, and you said, when you, right here, this is, a, this is a, one of my favorite parts of the book, so when you, if you go out and buy this book, read page five and six, and you say, I thought about the decades my grandmother had put in working at a tractor factory. I thought about how far my family had come from the cotton fields in Mississippi. I thought about my mother working one, two, three shifts a day. Three shifts of basically no sleep. I thought about the rough streets selling drugs, dodging bullets. But here's what I thought was interesting. After you said you thought about James Barker Jr., Andre King, and Black Rob, all close friends of mine who were shot to death. Then you said, and this was so great because everybody in, his, everybody in their life story has a few people that believed in them when nobody did. And you said, I thought about Detective Rick Geller of the Racine Police Department who gave me a second chance. I thought about Ethan Allen parole board who set you, Ethan Allen was where you incarcerated. Yeah. Who set me free. So what did Rick Geller do for you? Like he believed in your story? Like it, it, it was so crazy because uh, Rick Geller was a, a sergeant on the racing police force and I was in a drug raid as I was in high school playing high school basketball and he comes into the house, they bust down the door, boom. I'm thinking that, I don't know what it is, it could be a robbery, it could be anything. And the ATF run upstairs and I'm in the bed, I cover myself up, I don't know what's going to happen, shots fired or whatever. And it's the police, they identify themselves, guns drawn, and they handcuffed me. I had a cast on my hand at the time because I had a, a broken hand, it was fractured. And they handcuffed me, they take me downstairs, they seize the house, searching everything. And Rick Geller is the head detective on the case. They said, we got what we got. Bingo, we got the jackpot. They come back up with a little bit over an ounce and a half of crack cocaine. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, damn. With my priors, with everything, my, my mind just racing because I know I'm facing 10 to 15 years in prison. And as I'm sitting there, Rick, they said, we got him, book him, like take him to the paddy whack. I don't think it's his. Huh. So he gave you the benefit of the doubt. He just gave me the benefit of the doubt and, and we had a conversation before he uncuffed me. He didn't know I was an athlete. Yeah. Didn't know anything like that, but he just showed me favor. It was the weirdest thing because I've been in cars where someone flee the, flee the scene and we sat there and none of the stuff is ours, but because whoever fleed the scene, everybody go to jail for yeah. what the situation is. And for them in this situation to have something yeah. And not charge. They had something. Yeah, had but more you know than what? something. That's America, what America's supposed to be founded on, is that you're innocent till proven guilty. And there's so many people rotting away. In my dad, when I was born, similar story. But my mom says, Ty, when I was pregnant with you, the FBI kicked the door down, put my dad in prison. My dad's from Harlem. That's why I was born in L.A. He got put in a, an island prison called Terminal Island off L.A. in Long Beach. And there's so many people, though, rotting in prisons because of the system that they grew up in. Poverty creates crime, period. Rich people or people who have enough, they don't really, I've been to Sweden, Norway, the richest country in the world. There's very little crime. So you can just blame the people committing the crime selling drugs, but that's oversimplifying. 
you get you have to look at the bigger problem and you have to it's justice but also mercy so this guy had mercy on you and look how you turn you know how you turned out professional about and he could have just ended that but he had mercy and that's the lesson for all of us to remember sometimes you got to have justice but sometimes you have to give the benefit of the doubt and have mercy i still you know to this day i still can't believe it we talk on the daily um, really? Yeah, still to wow. this day. Um, he's part of the project that we're doing, you know, going forward with the, the biopic. And, you know, I've taken him on the book tour, went to the White House, Champions of Change. Yeah. Um, you know, just rallying uh, communities together, talking about the relationship between grassroots and community. Yeah. Because I had that. Yeah. Like, even with everything going on out there in the world, I had someone that showed me favor. So yeah. I had to say that, you know, with all the bad, there's some good cops out there, yeah. some good people out there. I used to feel the same way. Yeah. I was arrested 11 or 12 times easy. Yeah. And this guy showed me favor that just changed my life, changed my whole perspective about a lot of things. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great story. Now, let me fast forward. So you, you so you growing up, family comes from poverty, like so many people. You start, you get this mercy from this police officer and some things transpire. You're drafted number 10 in the NBA draft 2002. Tell us best memory. You're there in the NBA. Who are some icons playing around you? You're this rookie. I you gotta, remember the first time when you looked out and this guy walked on the court and you're like, man, I used to look up to you. Who was it? We got the shoes on right now, man. MG, MJ came out there? MJ, MJ, fade away perfect. <laughs> It was a it was a dream come true. Did you um, guard him? Cause you're about yeah. You play off guard, right? You I play played him? I played his last his last game was in Miami. Really? Pat Riley, true story. Pat Riley come, he said, "All right, I don't want to see nobody shake his hand. I know he's Michael Jordan. I don't give a shit. Nobody <laughs> shake his hand. Nobody conversate with him. Nothing. Everybody like, all right, yeah, let's go get him. Like, you know, let's go beat the Wizards because he's playing with the Wizards. It's his last game. He's like 40 or yeah, whatever. Yeah, 40. Still getting yeah. it. He's averaging 20 a game. Yeah. So, you know, he's like, he comes out, standing ovation. And before the game start, before tip-off, Pat Riley said, hold up. Before the game start, I just want to let everybody know, Michael, you're the greatest. And he raises his, rap, his, his number in the rafters at the Miami Airline Arenas. So he, he, even though he never played in Miami, so he, he got his guy. number retired in Miami. <laughs> that sounds good. Never been done in professional sports history. Another retired team retired your number. Team. That's why Obama said at that dinner, he said, Michael Jordan's so good that all they said, they can use him to compare to anything. It's like, you're the Michael Jordan of swimming. You're the Michael Jordan of business. Now he was the Michael Jordan of Miami, but he never played in Miami. Never played, but he's the greatest. Did you guard him? The whole time. He scored 20 points on me in the first quarter. Really? At the age of oh, no. 40. Wait, how old were you? I was every bit of 20. Did he talk Did he talk any crap to you? Yeah, uh, of course. You, you're going to be good one day. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you got a Snapchat. Don't say. No, uh, you don't need to. Just put No, he's uh, <laughs> You're going to be good one day. You're going to be good one day. You're going to be good one that day. That is classic. I can see. I, you never play against Larry Bird. But Larry never played against Larry. That. We have Zach in here somewhere. Or did Zach actually. Let me get it. Oh. Zach's there. We say Zach looks like Larry Bird's uncle. Roll, roll a little camera on there. Zach. He, he favors Larry Legend. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Legend right there. You can, you can close that. Press that twice, close it, and delete it. Okay. So what did Michael Jordan say to you as a rookie? What, what crap did he talk? Man, he was just like too slow. And, you know, every time I do well, something. What did he say? He said that one. He said, you'll be great one day. You'll be great one day, young fella. <laughs> After like, he's still like, he's 40 years old. Wait, let me and, get that one time. And he's that. kicking me right here. What did Jordan say to you? You'd be great one day, young fella. You'd be great one day. I gotta remember that line. That's a great, that's the way to talk shit on the court. You'd be good one day. You'd Special, one man. Day. Pooh! We're talking about Jordan. We got Pooh Richardson here. He plays in basketball. He's a little bit ahead. What year did you retire, Pooh? 2000. Yeah, so he came in in 02. Right. Pooh, what's going on? What up, bro? What's good, family? How you, fam? How right. you, you good? See, everything's all right? Yes, sir. We got two. Two, two lottery picks right here. 
Hey, but I gotta, I, I gotta throw in my story. So here's my story about being drafted number ten. All right, because I, I got a story. It's not as good as that, but I, you know, I, I played. I grew up playing basketball in the projects. You can't let people tell their war stories without you telling yours. So I moved to North Carolina when I was 13. Never picked up a basketball. Played soccer out here. Um, we moved next door to projects. So we lit our house. The bus stop was in the project, so I remember going to basketball court for the first time. We had to get, I got there early, I don't know why. Everybody played basketball. I remember picking that ball up and being like, this is a hard sport. But I went crazy, I started playing eight, 10 hours a day. That was about 13. So 15, I went to one of the biggest high schools in Raleigh. You know it's basketball country mm-hmm. in North Carolina. John Wall, Lee, uh, Stackhouse, Jordan, all of them come from, Michael Jordan from this league. So I go JV. I get on the JV team at this big inner city school, biggest, biggest one is about 95% black. Me, I was the only Spanish guy there and like 100 white kids. And then the coach came to me, this is my story, make sure you get this, this is like being drafted. <laughs> the varsity coach came to me and said, I'm putting you on varsity. And I was only a sophomore. This went on, went on to win state championship. So, you know, I got a little story. I got a little story. Hey, it's not like 10 in the draft. It's not, like, it's not, it's this good of a story. That's but a special me, feeling right there. Hey, and then our first game, Jerry Stackhouse came out. And I, I was like, wait a second, they have a man on their team. They got a grown man came and dunked in the, in the, and you weren't, you got a technical, you know, you're not allowed to dunk in the, in the warm up, but he came in there to intimidate. He played at Kingston. Jerry Stackhouse was good in high school. He was a problem.